So panel members, come on up. So what we have here for everyone tonight is just not a rec recreation of some conversations that we've had, but more importantly, an opportunity to sort of hear a little bit across countries and uh, as well as certainly across Canada, other things that are going on. And these folks have agreed to, to be up here to share that with you um, as well. And online we have, can you get them pinned? Oh yeah, Mike. Yeah, there you go, Michael Barber, and who is a lead researcher for State of the Nation, as well as one of the founders and honorary life member Candy Learn, as well as now Frank McCallum, who's also the chair of Candy Learn. So when you guys get the mic, we can maybe introduce you. Well, let's start with them. So just quick, quick hello to the crowd. Hey there, I'm Michael Barber at Toro University, of California, down in lovely Vallejo, and. Uh, I'm keeping you from the alcohol, so I will stop there. And I'm Frank McCallum. I'm an associate principal with Vista Virtual School in, in Calgary, Alberta. I'm also the chair of the Canny Learn board, and we are in very smoky Calgary right now. So, Yeah, smoky here too. So, and up here in the panel, starting with Danica, whom you don't know yet. Hi, I'm Danica, again. <laughs> Do you want Thanks. me? No, that's, that's good, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was good. <laughs> Hi folks, I'm John Watson. Uh, I am part of a team running uh, the Digital Learning Collaborative in the US and a conference called DLAC, the Digital Learning Annual Conference. Uh, we're sort of the US version of Can eLearn. Hello. Yeah, just, just leave them on when you get, click them on. It takes a minute for them to come up. Can you hear me? There we go. My name's Paul Hembling. I'm principal of uh, At Cool, Kamloops Open Online Learning, and I'm very happy to be here with most of my teaching staff. Um, and we're from beautiful Kamloops, British Columbia. Happy to be here. Thank you. I'm Lisa Bruce. I'm from Ontario, from the Ontario eLearning Consortium. Uh, we are a uh, uh, organization that works in Ontario to um, help school boards or districts, I guess you call them out here, to um, share e-learning between different school boards. So we share them across the province. So that's what we do. Thanks, Lisa. I'm Gabe Linder. I am uh, unintentionally embodying the sustainability theme by wearing a sweater that uh, I inherited from my father. Uh, so it's great. I forgot about the sustainability theme. I'm the principal of TLA Online, an independent online school uh, in British Columbia. And I'm on the board of FISA, the Federation of Independent Schools Association, and on the uh, sector advisory committee that's doing some of the work on the new online policy and um, uh, AQA and a few other things. Yeah. Can I Gabe? have a redo? That was a lot of things. So I, yes, BCEDL. PSA Vice President, also here representing teachers in my role, and also a current OLTD uh, alum member. Yeah, and she survived me I too. I, I just have to do something okay. else for you guys. Yes, so I'll add those things to my introduction. Thank you, thank you. I also want to say for, about Gabe as well, he's also on the planning committee for the event here, so has been for quite a while. So yeah, yeah, I know. But you, you've been there, you've been there. Once Busy in a while. guy, busy guy. Uh, and some of you may remember Todd Pottle from April. Uh, he was also with the Ontario eLearning Consortium and still is, except he got quadrupled in size. He got cloned four times. So basically, program committee, uh, program coordination, which Todd did uh, has done for OELC, that's Lisa's purview. The directing uh, is now done John Proctor, who was also uh, hoping to be here, but it's actually almost 10.30 back east. It is for Lisa body-wise, but at least we've got her here. We tricked her. We fed her dinner. Um, so it's, a, it's an important change in, about the consortium models. And we know how well consortium models have worked in BC because you had to. You had to band together to help survive through it. And WCLN with Bruce, who's also on the Candy Learn board, is a good example of that collaborative effort to, uh, to pull together. So 
That's hats off to the consortiums, hats off to BCEDL for taking on leadership roles and things like that. It's through these groups here that you have a voice and you get better abilities to teach. That's the goal that we're going for. So let's get some updates. So starting, do you want to lead it off, Danica? Do you are no, or should we go backwards? OK, so Gabe will lead us off. And basically, and so looking at independent, with an independent focus, we all know what's going on in BC, kind of. And we're waiting for tomorrow so we can hear from Sophia and the rest of the ministry folks about what might be up the sleeve or what's coming. And we know this has been, this has been the longest transition I've ever seen, short of maybe the dissolution of my first marriage, OK? <laughs> that this has been going on for three years in BC, this whole transition. <laughs> so, yeah, on, on that cheery note, sorry, Tracy. Um, the, the policy changes from a perspective of independent here in BC, just some top of the mind things, and then also for Danica, who's not sitting in that, those board meetings, in those transition meetings, and meetings that actually Thomas has been sitting in, in some of the cases, what does it mean for a teacher? So just some quick top of mind perspectives. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> it's not really clear yet, you know, talking about what the policy changes are, because they're all still in, in draft, and they haven't been widely distributed to, to, uh, to the sector. But something that I've appreciated to not exactly address your question, uh, but to address the uh, comment about the dissolution of your first marriage, is uh, that the, the time that it's taken has actually been really appreciated, I think, because uh, the ministry has, I think, been very deliberate and careful about implementing such a big change in the province. And uh, from the independent perspective, I think we've felt very uh, heard in terms of our concerns and representing the concerns of our parents and families. A big turning point from the perspective of teachers and parents were some uh, public forums that the ministry put on to gather the perspectives of parents on what uh, changes to online learning in BC might mean, such as if parents were no longer able to maintain a relationship with the school that they had, uh, in some of our cases, their grandchildren uh, had attended. Um, yeah, so we felt very heard. The ministry really tried to gather perspectives from various stakeholder groups and is continuing to do that through the sector advisory committee that represents a number of different stakeholder groups, BCTF, BC teachers and uh, vice principals, BC principals and vice principals associations, superintendents, FINESC, Métis Nation. Um, so it's been, I think, a very valuable process. And for us as leaders to be able to transmit that to our teachers and the fact that the change has been slow has i think from at least my perspective um given the teachers a bit of a sense of calm about the the, the process uh, even though it is still a bit nebulous as to what the final outcome will be at least the schools in bc that are provincial online learning schools now at least you know we have well those of us who are provincial online learning schools have that assurance and that part is in place there's still a, a long not too far yet to go to complete the process so it feels like we're like just right getting to the finish line of a lot of big changes and i really think that the changes don't seem like they are going to be that actually uh earth shaking you know i don't think the whole landscape is going to change that much uh, from our perspective um, from my school the biggest change is changing the lms honestly and that's been the, our focus is our move to Brightspace, but, uh, and that's been a lot of work for teachers, but uh, that's my opening salvo. There you go. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Uh, yeah, to echo that, I think the, the, the speed has been slow, but I think the changes, so one of the committees that I was part of at the very beginning of the change was trying to decide what these polls were going to look like um, and how many there were going to be and all of that. Uh, and I think it was it was nice to have that that teacher voice to have a BCTF representation on those committees on those discussion panels. Um, and I think you kind of alluded to it that the fear, the uncertainty from the teaching perspective, because there are a lot of schools in this province that that weren't sure if they were going to be 
you know, granted that status and whether or not those teachers were going to keep their jobs. So that that has been a big sense for teachers in our province. Just are, are we going to be able to keep our job? What is it going to look like? So that that fear, that uncertainty of change has been something that I think we've lived with for a couple of years now. Um, but then you also said it doesn't seem like they're going to be earth shattering changes. So from two years ago to now, those changes that were alluded to or hinted at were going to be earth shattering. And now it, not much has changed other than many schools changed their LMS, including the one that I work at. So that that has been the major change. Everything else pretty much is is staying the same. So that's my teacher perspective. Yeah. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Don't know. Um, so uh, speaking of consultation processes and announcements, Frank, uh, if your game, give us a little insight into it's on again, off again uh, in Alberta around uh, distance learning. <laughs> Where to go? Uh, there's there's a couple of things that are um, happening in Alberta that are causing us a little bit of consternation and make it more challenging every year. Obviously, we're talking about high level stuff here, uh, not the the individual day to day things like. Uh, class size, composition, the things that we're all familiar with. But uh, the, the two things that are having the biggest impact on how we operate for distance learning are number one, uh, we're just in the, the starting phases of a curriculum changeover. And obviously there are implications around resource development and how we implement a new curriculum. But uh, the second part is, um, while the, the broad strokes of our funding manual have largely changed, the, stayed the same, the details have changed fundamentally every year for the last three years. And that's impacted how we register students. Two years ago, there was basically one intake for distance education students and that was it. Last year it was continuous. You could register anytime. This year it's two intakes. So it's kind of difficult for us to plan things like staffing, to, to really determine what the workflow was going to be for the school um, based on what's been happening with all of that. And then, of course, in the background of all of it, I mean, it's all influenced by, as you can imagine, uh, a fairly volatile political situation in the province. And, and that's really what looks after the, both the curriculum change and the funding manual piece. The other piece I'll mention about the funding manual is that uh, um, four years ago, they put in accountability measures. And we have been pressing for how exactly are these accountability um, measures going to be measured? And it's difficult, if not impossible, to find out what exactly is going to be used for those measurements to the point where we think that the department or the ministry is just going to simply step away from the broad accountability measures that they put into their funding manual four years ago. So it's been an interesting time, but still a great time. We're finding lots of uh, uptick on distance education. Obviously, once we get past the, the COVID bump, what we're seeing is that our registrations are above where they have historically been. So it's been a, you know, it's been a kind of a rising tide raises all boats kind of situation where our distance education system is, is seeing more activity. Thanks, Frank. And, and Michael, I'm going to come to you last to sort of uh, wrap up a little bit about Quebec and, and the Maritimes as well and maybe make some comments across. Uh, I'll try to refrain from doing that and let you do that this time. So um, Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan just announced uh, that they are going to have a central distance learning system run by the Ministry of Education. They used to have one, but then they just offloaded it to the school divisions. Now they want it back. So we had a, uh, Michael and I had a quick talk with one of the, the contacts we have there, said, so what's going on? He said, you tell me, I don't know, they just announced this. So as much as BC has consultation, other provinces, Zippo, we're just gonna decree what's gonna happen. So uh, I'm sure that this will sort its way through, but we'll find out more, keep you informed if you wanna catch up with Candy Alert. So Ontario. Okay, so Ontario. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with what we have in Ontario, but we are lucky enough that the Ministry of Education does provide bright space for all teachers and students in the province of Ontario. So that's something that we're very thankful for. Um, that started in about 2007. 
ish, I think, with the beginning of eLearning Ontario, which is the branch of the ministry that looks after eLearning in Ontario. So um, that went on for a while. There's one funded position for each school board that the ministry also funds that to help support um, the use of Brightspace and the pedagogy around eLearning in the school board. Um, so that kind of developed for a little while. The ministry also provides some course content, so not for every single course that we offer, but for, so for, this is for secondary. Um, they offer or they provide like full courses for teachers so they can become an e-learning teacher and for many courses there's kind of this gift wrap package of a course that's ready for them to teach. The jury is out on whether that's a good thing or not, so we won't get into that right now, but that's available for some courses. Um, so fast forward until about 2018, I think, the e-learning kind of gradually went with e-learning in two, 2007. Not every school, but in fact, very few school boards had e-learning programs. And so with having Brightspace available to every school board, every school, every teacher, every student in the province, e-learning did gradually grow. Then we got to about 2018, 2017, 2018, I think. Um, and the government then suddenly came out with a, a PPM, that's a policy program memorandum. It's like the ministry's um, their policy statements and said that students are going to be required to take four e-learning courses. That's going to be mandatory. It actually wasn't a PPM at that point. It was an announcement from the ministry where they said that students are going to have to take four mandatory e-learning courses. So the government at that time liked to kind of float things out there to see that the public reaction was going to be, and it wasn't great. So there is a lot of outcry from many, many different people. And then I think this like sort of a blessing in disguise for the ministry that the pandemic hit <laughs> and that conversation and the uproar around those four mandatory courses kind of really died down as people started dealing with the pandemic. I think they learned from that. They did a lot of consultation with a bunch of different people, the directors of education, um, some different parent groups, teachers, um, the, our organization, so the OELC, the Ontario eLearning Consortium, um, were consulted. They asked a lot of people for opinions. And then last February came out with their actual PPM or this policy and program memorandum that now states that students are required sort of to have two e-learning courses to graduate. And I say sort of because I like it's optionally mandatory because people can opt out of it. So they can just, parents or students over 18 can go in and say, I don't want to have to do this. And then they say, okay, so they just have to sign a document. So for most people it's mandatory unless you say you don't want it. So that's where we are in Ontario. <laughs> So, so apparently BC wasn't the only three-year journey because you also had a three-year journey from that announcement. That was in March of 2019, wasn't it? When they announced that? Just before that? the pandemic, yeah. Yeah. So uh, interesting. The, the, trying to figure out there are some parallels. And this is purely with the intention uh, of actually, so you see a bit more of the landscape across. You're not alone, necessarily. So um, let's see, who are we going to next? Oh, Michael. So. Well, I guess for something completely different, they're trying to force everyone in Ontario to take online learning, whereas when you go across the border into Quebec, um, they're trying to stop everyone from taking online learning as much as they possibly can. Um, so basically, the, the ministry has, um, unlike Saskatchewan, where Randy just said that, you know, the ministry for a long time just took their hands and washed themselves of it and let the districts and the school divisions do whatever they wanted. Um, Quebec has basically decided that school divisions, uh, school districts can't do anything. Um, so the online programs there sort of operate on the periphery. Um, they, or they cater to students that aren't able to go to school, um, which right now usually means a medical exemption because of COVID. Um, in fact, it was only actually about this time last year. Um, yeah, but exactly a year ago now, they uh, there was a charter case that uh, they went into Quebec um, because there was a, a group of parents that wanted to be able to keep their kids in remote learning because of uh, health reasons of household members, not of the child. Uh, so the child was well enough to go to school, but, you know, they were worried about them bringing it home to family members. And um, they took them to court over it and ended up losing uh, because of that. And uh, now they do have a number, probably about a dozen, dozen and a half pilot projects that they started about a year and a half ago. But oddly enough, these are mostly look like the type of hybrid learning 
environments that we see in Ontario that uh, everyone hated um, in Ontario, or the, the co-seating or co-located or uh, to use the American term, the concurrent teaching uh, environments. And so most of the distance learning pilots that we're seeing in Quebec right now, which are pretty small scale, uh, that's sort of what they look like. It's a teacher in a room with some students broadcasting to other students who may be in rooms in other schools or may be sitting at home. And Atlanta, Canada. Um, well, Atlanta, Canada is actually probably the most stable place in, in the entire country, save maybe PEI, but PEI has only got like a dozen people living there, so they don't really matter. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm a Newfoundlander, so, you know, we make fun of the other islands in, in, in the area. Um, but if you look at Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and, P and uh, New Brunswick, they've had um, basically centralized ministry-run programs uh, for pretty much most of the last two decades. Uh, they've looked slightly differently from time to time, uh, but have been fairly stable. Um, PEI had a ministry run program up until about, uh, I guess about seven or eight years ago, but because it just wasn't being used because you can literally, you know, throw a ball from one end of uh, PEI to the other. Um, they basically had maybe a hand, usually it was about a dozen and a half, two dozen students that were taking French courses online from New Brunswick. Although last, actually the 2020-21 school year, they began piloting an online program uh, once again. So they're um, trying to get something started up on their own. Um, and they had started it actually just, uh, just as COVID uh, was hitting. Yeah, and it, the same thing in the territories uh, and in as well as Yukon, they have starting up the, I think Yukon's probably more robust. I don't think Northwest Territories has got, there's really rocking and rolling yet, right? Um, they are in year five of a three year pilot project. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, okay, so before we're going to go to John, but John gets a, a word after, but I really think that. Paul's probably got something to kind of share a little bit because, let's face it, the audience is is BC based for almost to a T. Anyone, anyone from out of British Columbia? Anyone here out of BC? Well, besides, oh, like, oh, yay, okay, all right. So, uh, so Paul, a little bit about some of your observations, experiences sitting in the principal's chair. It's uh, cool. Thank you, Randy. Um... So probably lots of you can identify with our situation in BC. I don't think I need to tell you too, too much about what's going on, but we've had some pretty rich discussions um, in some of the some of the leadership meetings that uh, Randy sponsored as well as Canny Learn in the last couple of months. And we had a pretty rich dialogue prior to, to this meeting here earlier in the day just to talk about uh, some of our collective challenges, um, our collective successes, and just some, I think, some really good back and forth about um, problem solving and what might be coming next. Um, I think one of the really positive things that everybody is seeing, and if there can be a positive from COVID, um, I think probably the explosion of DL and uh, the innovation that's happened as a result of that, everybody in this room has experienced to some extent. Um, as I call myself the pandemic principal, I, uh, I got... I've been an elementary principal, I've been a secondary principal most of my career, I've been a secondary science and math teacher. Um, I got uh, my job as DL principal literally two weeks before they closed Disneyland, three weeks before they closed Disneyland, February 2020. I'd been going to Disneyland, so that wasn't great, but uh, three years later I did get my money back. Anyway, um, true story. Um, I think at COOL, our enrollment went I think it quadrupled, quintupled um, from the time before COVID to the height of COVID. Um, and we have dropped back now to about 50% of what our maximum was just in terms of enrollment. So um, things are still more robust in DL than they were pre-pandemic, but uh, the up and down of enrollment, that, that can be challenging, right? So you don't really know what your, what your projections are gonna be and the way districts do staffing, um, particularly in the DL world. I don't think I need to tell anybody here when you're staffed according to your September 29th, 1701 numbers, but you're having to build your staff for the year based on the kids that you had on paper before all the other schools in your district decided to give you all of their kids that didn't show up. 
Um, I see a lot of nodding heads. Those can be some very, very challenging plans to make um, as you try to form your staffing. Um, one of the discussions that we've had um, sort of as a, as a group of DL administrators is uh, the challenge with the coming policy from the ministry. And I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, the ministry sessions at our, at our conference. I'm glad to see the ministry here. Um, I think there's um, two, two or three pieces of policy that they're going to be unveiling. Um, if not, I think we'll probably get a bit of a, a bit of a window into it. I don't think they're going to tell us too, too much here. Um, I'd, be, I'd love to be wrong, um, but we're going to find out about uh, what those um, online learning agreements might look like that, that are in draft right now. We're going to find out a little bit um, about the assessment and <laughs> there we go no oh, I'm back um, the assessment and quality assurance framework that I know Gabe uh, has has been a part of by the way fun fact Gabe and I went to high school together isn't that weird I'll let you try to figure out who was older uh, he was a heck of a basketball player Oh, he points at me, yeah. Why, because I'm bald? Is that it? Yeah. Um, so we're going to find out about the assessment and quality assurance. Some of the conversations um, that have happened around that are, and this is one of the challenges um, that we've, we've chatted about, as DL schools, as DL principals, we are already probably some of the most accountable principles in the education system in the province of British Columbia because of the audit requirements that we have in terms of um, student learning plans, in terms of ensuring that students are activated before we claim funding, um, the frequency of audit of DL schools. Um, that's certainly a higher standard than bricks and mortar school, schools are held to. When the uh, policy was first um, I'm not going to say released, discussed with us in, in our consultation meetings. And um, please understand, I think the consultation process in BC has been um, exemplary compared to how it's gone in other jurisdictions. Um, we've heard stories about how things have gone in the US and other parts of Canada. Um, my Ontario colleagues, I'm, I've, it's been very eye-opening hearing about how things have gone um, in Ontario, including the fact that they're a bright space jurisdiction as well, and just differences and similarities to how bright space has rolled out. Um, but one of, one of those challenges is that um, the quality assurance framework that I think we were all very excited about at the beginning, and I think that is a, a big positive for online learning, because um, one, one of the difficulties that we face is um, a lack of consistency um, across and between jurisdictions. I think that's probably the reason why the, the province is moving to this model. Um, through those consultations, as most of you are aware, that changed from the quality assurance um, framework to the accountability and quality assurance framework. Well, for principals who are already uh, in a position where we're very accountable um, to the ministry in terms of 1701 and delivery of curriculum, et cetera, um, to now have um, an accountability framework added on top of that. One of my colleagues mentioned this will make us by far the most accountable school leaders in the system. So we're a little bit apprehensive to see what does that actually look like, because I don't know that accountability and quality assurance necessarily go hand in hand in terms of time management in your leadership tasks. So we had a fair amount of discussion about that. Um, I, I'm going to challenge you on that one. I had the opportunity to de develop a curriculum and then teach the first course of Royal Roads that was accountability, uh, quality and educational effectiveness. And I said, those are all opposites. No, there's a way in which they come together because it depends on what you mean by accountability and to whom is the person accountable. So the assumption is the school's accountable, more accountable to the ministry. Perhaps it's not just the school. Well, that needs to be in that accountability structure. But we'll see what BC rolls out. But it, it, you know, it looks like it's going to be following the same path the same consult, consultation and the same input that was received from all of you who had a voice or people that represent you as a voice. So this is all new, right? It's never happened before. And it's only being replicated here in Canada because we do things very differently. Right, John? I flew here from a meeting of about 30 of our organization's executive committee members. We had the exact same discussions for two days. 
The, the themes are almost exactly the same. Some of the details, of course, are a little bit different, as you'd expect, uh, as they vary between, uh, between your provinces. Uh, but they're very, very similar uh, conversations. I want to touch on a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, Michael Barber talked about the differences between Ontario and Quebec. Uh, same exact thing in U.S. states, uh, including neighboring states in plenty of time, plenty of examples. Uh, where there, there's just a very, very different policy environment, school environment, uh, despite them being neighboring states. Uh, so we do see those, those same differences. Uh, Paul touched on the... Paul touched on... Is that better? Paul touched on the uh, explosion of, of DL uh, and uh, referencing the, the pandemic, uh, and that is certainly also what we're seeing. Uh, the way we're thinking about our situation in the US these days is it's really uh, an inflection point for all flavors of digital learning. Uh, online uh, schools, online courses, hybrid, blended. Uh, and what I mean by that, and, and I know you've all experienced something quite similar, uh, during the pandemic, uh, essentially all students in the US all teachers and families experienced emergency remote learning. Now that wasn't uh, in a lot of cases, despite the heroic efforts of teachers and, and school administrators, in a lot of cases that wasn't a very good experience for most students in the US, uh, for many students in the US. But enough students and families and teachers had a really good experience that they started to think, well, wait a second, maybe this is a better option or maybe it's not exactly the option I want, but maybe I want some of this. Maybe I want to build back some of the agency that I had in that online learning environment. Maybe I, I want to build, in, build back in some of the flexibility that I had in that environment as well. And so for quite a number of students, going back to what they perceive as the constraints of the pre-pandemic learning environment has not been a great experience for them. So what we're seeing, and several people have mentioned this, is growth in numbers in all these different areas that, uh, that we're talking about. A couple of final observations. So in the US, a lot of online and blended and hybrid learning activity pre-pandemic had come through uh, charter schools, uh, not, not being run by the school district, but being run by a different entity. Uh, charter schools, private schools, and state-run course providers. Well, post-pandemic, we're seeing a lot more districts running, starting, and now running their own, uh, what they're typically calling online schools. And, and I think that's really a good thing. I, in, in terms of the charter schools, the private schools, uh, et cetera, having, they have a really, really important role to play in the larger online learning and blended learning system. But it's still the case in the US that 85% or so of students are attending the traditional public school in their neighborhood, in their district. And that means that they are going to continue to look for those schools to provide these options. And now many of those districts are providing it uh, in a lot of cases for the first time. The last piece I'll mention what this means is that even these districts that are saying, hey, we have an online school, now we have a virtual academy. What they actually mean is they are running a hybrid school, not, and not that kind of hybrid that was associated with uh, the, the, the not great delivery of emergency remote learning. But in some cases, what I think are some of the most interesting, most exciting schools that are out there uh, that are combining truly the best of online with truly the best of face-to-face -face and being really intentional about what should happen in those two uh, learning mod modalities. Thank you, yes, to quote Tony Bates, taking the affordances of each of the learning environments and applying the best of them together. So it'd uh, be interesting to know a little bit more about those models. And I think, John, you published quite a, quite a bit through the Digital Learning Collaborative uh, in terms of some of the information and what you're learning on your blog. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, yes, but I'm not quite sure what you're trying to teach. I'm just here. saying, Sorry, I'm going to invite everybody, <laughs> if you want to find out more, follow John. That's what I, no, nothing, nothing horrific, John. Uh, so Frank and then Michael, any comments? So Frank, first, any summary things that you have that you see or insights? I don't know about insights. I, I find it interesting that John talked about the 
the profusion of uh, new online schools that are, are popping up, we're, we're seeing, the, or we have been seeing the same sort of thing in Alberta, where we went from a centralized system to a decentralized system, and every school division was encouraged uh, and provided seed money to start their own online school. And that was two years ago, and already we're seeing a lot of that drop off. So um, there's definitely more traction around distance education, but it's largely going to the already established schools that were there before the pandemic occurred. So I find that that pretty interesting. Uh, I guess the only other thing I can say is um, I, what I appreciate from John is the sort of research and data driven stuff uh, to be able to, to find meaningful research that uh, speaks to the, the context of distance education in the K to 12 setting, preferably in Canada, but I will take it anywhere these days. Michael. I guess I'd just pick up on a, a couple of things as we sort of finish off here. Um, you know, John mentioned that, you know, we're seeing a lot of districts that are, are, are joining. Um, I think that's a little bit less so in the Canadian context. Uh, and, and the reason I think is because in, at least in the Canadian context, those districts that had a need for it already had some presence in the system. Um, maybe with the notable exception of Quebec, obviously. Um, so uh, the other thing that we've we've seen, and, and we see it in the U.S. as well, is that, you know, John mentioned those folks that, you know, had that really bad experience with, with the emergency remote learning. And even over the past two, two and a half years, um, you know, when things should have been a lot better, um, still really remote learning as opposed to online learning. Um, a lot of those folks have sort of retracted in, you know, or retrenched from that, that position in terms of wanting to do it. So a lot of the, the districts that I think are taking the plunge post-pandemic were those that were already thinking about it and were pretty close to, you know, moving in that direction prior to the pandemic. And the pandemic was just sort of the kick in the pants that they needed to get things done. Um, by the same token, you've got some districts that and, and some school leaders in those districts that have, because of the experience of the past, you know, two and a half, three years, uh, have decided that, you know, come hell or high water, they will never allow their kids to come, you know, to take an online course ever again. Um, so and I, I think there's almost as many of the, the, the latter as there is the former, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, particularly in the U.S., um, less so in Canada, I think, but. Okay, thank you both for beaming in uh, at, uh, from your places, and uh, they, I dragged them both into an afternoon meeting as well. So uh, I think I owe them a lot of coming back, and certainly want to thank folks up here, Danica, for getting up here for one of the first times, right? Every year. Well, you know, you're in front, <laughs> but having but having having Randy Randy to say. You have to you have to talk about your experiences. Uh, certainly, Gabe, for for being there as well in terms of the independent, which is an important part for all of us to understand that we're not we're not alone in these struggles. Lisa flew all the way out here, uh, and in reciprocal, I'm going back to her event in November. Or, well, it's now your event because you're running it, but OELC is having a one as well uh, for that. Paul, thank you so much for being in the position of speaking about what the ministry changes are as they, as they affect you directly. It's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot to a certain extent, but thank you for sharing openly and honestly. Uh, but mostly thank you as well, John, for being here again. He was here in April uh, with us and uh, has been a solid contributor to what we've been doing over the many years here in Canada, but also wanting to learn and share some of the experiences that we have here back in DLAC, which uh, the DLAC conference is in February in Austin, and I get to go again, finally, uh, directly. Uh, the last couple of years were virtual, as most of us were virtual in many things, uh, but to share some of the things around Canada and hopefully meet with a few other fellow Canadians who maybe aren't connected to what's happening. So these events are really important, and you say, well, what's, why is it doesn't affect my teaching? It, what, what I take away from these events and this sharing is that, hey, I'm not alone. And if I, and then as well, maybe there's some interesting thoughts 
because John will be here for tomorrow morning. Lisa's around for a while, and you know how to find everybody else that's basically in the room. But as well, Michael's quite accessible and has had conversations with a lot of folks uh, as well about what's going on. So you've got people and networks here to tap into for some good discussion. And I'm sure that you'll also, after with the ministry, will have a need, a need and an opportunity to process that and to continue this discussion, the dialogue. I have to say I'm impressed that BC has kept that consultation going, despite the fact that COVID interrupted, despite the fact that they interrupted processes in the middle of things, and despite the fact that the personnel who are leading this has changed. But BC has persisted. So I think that's one thing that we can bank on to see that continue to work. So thanks very much to the panel, the virtual folks as well. Thank you to Thomas and Danica for having allowing this opportunity for us to speak and to share some of this with you. So enjoy the social and that's it. I get to sit back and relax now. <laughs>